Spotlight to bring you in-depth analysis on the trial of Austin Police Officer Christopher Taylor. He's on trial this week for the murder of Michael Ramos in April 2020. Officer Christopher Taylor was called to an apartment complex for reports of a man with a gun involved in a possible drug deal. No gun was ever found, but officers confronted Michael Ramos in the parking lot. Those officers first used a beanbag shotgun to stun Ramos, but then he jumped in a car and started driving. As he pulls out, that's when Officers Taylor and only Officer Taylor fired, killing Ramos. All throughout this week, we'll be bringing in attorneys from our community to recap each day and provide in-depth analysis. Tonight, we have Austin Defense Attorney Amber Vasquez and also Rick Kofer, whose career spans both sides of the criminal docket, both prosecution and defense experience. And tonight, we thought we were going to be talking about perhaps opening statements. That is not where we are. Of course, generally, jury selection is very rarely newsworthy, but it's becoming newsworthy. And in this case, we are now uh, on the third day of jury selection with, with no jury sworn in at this point. So I just wanted to start by asking both of you, and Amber, I'll start with you. Um, We've talked about how important jury selection is, but it usually does not, or often does not at least, span three days. It's true. Uh, everything stems around jury selection. It is wildly important. Um, but in this case, they have gone through three different jury panels. And so what that means is they've called in 80 people from the community one day and gone through the entire selection process and then something went wrong, they've done it again, and now this is the third group. And so it is very unique <laughs> to have gone through this many uh, complete jury panels and still have not sworn in a jury. So Rick, let's just break it down very simply for people. So the clerk's office here in Travis County sends out jury summons to a number of people. The clerk's office chooses the number of people, is that correct? That's right, and that's a decision that's taken with input from the judge who will be presiding over the case. So, for example, in this instance, you would expect that the district clerk was directed to bring a larger panel than normal. This isn't just a routine trial. And Amber, once those people come to court then, of course, each side gets to interview that person and decide whether or not they would, would want to seat that person or strike them, right? Can you just walk us through that process? Well, so how it works is, say we have 80 people. Both sides, the state and the defense, make a presentation. And they ask fundamental questions of, can you follow the law? Like, do you have a, a, a bias towards or against police officers, for instance, would be something that could disqualify somebody from a jury. So have you been keeping up with this case is another one. Yeah. Exactly. Do you know things? Do you know parties in it? That would be another disqualifier, things like that. Or somebody that just says, I can't follow the punishment range. I can't follow the jury instruction. I don't agree with it. So those would all be reasons. And after all of those reasons, both sides get 10 strikes for any reason. Uh, other than race, but any other reason they can strike. And so it's more a process of deselection. Mm -hmm. So it's the first 12 who's left after all of that. That's how they get the jury. So it's a little bit complicated. And Rick, it's a painstaking process on any given trial, but in this case, the stakes are really high and the attention on the jury itself is going to be really high. That's right, it's a stressful trial if you're a juror who ends up making the box, if you're one of the people who makes the decision. It's a significant sacrifice of time, could even potentially end up with some scrutiny. We saw in the Daniel Perry trial uh, that there were accusations of juror misconduct and juror tampering that resulted in many of those jurors being brought back after a verdict to be interviewed. So the stakes are high, not just for the litigants in this case, but for all the participants, including members of the jury. I mean, essentially it's a job, right? You're getting hired for a job that may last one week, two weeks, three weeks, four. And that's why it's hard to get a real diverse panel because a lot of people can't step away from their work or life for a week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks. You know, a lot of folks, especially in a town like Austin, live paycheck to paycheck. and. That's just not a reality. 
And to that end, Tony, Ms. Vasquez makes a really good point. Travis County jurors tend to be unique. They tend to be highly educated. They tend to have very technical backgrounds. In some ways, they tend to be defense-oriented, uh, depending on the type of case. I've tried cases in 30-odd ju different jurisdictions. I've tried cases in a jurisdiction where I've asked, just by looking at my client, who here thinks she's guilty? And half the hands go up, right? Well, that doesn't work. And that doesn't happen in Travis County. But the, the secret that lawyers really don't uh, say, but it's true, lawyers don't want a fair jury. Lawyers want to identify jurors who have preconceived biases and prejudices that work in their favor. And I can assure you that if you're the district attorney right now, you generally want jurors to hear this case who are pro-law enforcement. And if you're the defense, you may have a different view. Did he just give away a trade secret? <laughs> no, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I disagree slightly in that, um, you know, trying cases all over the place. It's more kind of under people that are able to embrace your theory of the case of understanding the mechanics of how it works, that this is a case about, you know, police violence gone rampant or, you know, mistaken identity or whatever it is. And I think that people that can really understand that. And I think Rick's right in that it's nice to have a jury like we get in Travis County that are generally more educated and more technical because you may be looking for people with a little more nuance that can, you know, really dig into some of the science or, or right. maybe some of the studies that you want to present. So I want to go back in time a couple of days. So oftentimes, again, everything is heightened in this case. This is the first time that we've had an Austin police officer go on trial on a murder charge uh, in the on-duty shooting of, of a person. Um, so uh, jury selection does not often draw a lot of public interest or even a lot of media attention. But on Monday, we had members of the public, including, as I understand it, Michael Ramos's mother, who went down to the courthouse to watch jury selection. We had journalists who went down to the courthouse to watch jury selection. And there was an issue that has not been fully untangled yet, as I understand it at least, uh, with regard to the, uh, the court, the courtroom not being open. I want to talk about why it is so important and where is it rooted in the law that the public have access, and Rick, I'll start with you, to jury selection. It's a fundamental foundation of the rule of law. We don't have secret trials in the United States of America. And that's a right that accrues to the accused. Christopher Taylor has a right to an open and public process. There are very narrow circumstances in which upon the motion of a party, a judge can limit only for articulated reasons and really good reasons a person or some people uh, from publicly viewing a trial. What's been related in the media, and, and I wasn't physically present and I can't speak to it, is concerning. It appears that what happened on Monday when the courtroom doors were locked was likely an inadvertent error. It's the way it's and, been described by, by, by the defense and, and others involved in the case. That's right. And much to the credit of the presiding judge, that does represent fundamental error. And there is a good case law that that would be sufficient grounds to reverse a conviction in the event this trial resulted in a guilty verdict. And so what the judge did basically was basically declare mistrial mm -hmm. on Monday, throw out everything that happened on Monday, start over on Tuesday. Uh, they got through one panel on Tuesday of about 80 potential jurors, and then came back today to work through another 50 potential jurors. And so that's cost time, too, in terms of jury selection. All of it. And, you know, accountability is everything in this. I've done this almost 20 years and tried all kinds of cases, had whole ones on, on TV, and I will tell you, it matters. It matters for our community to be able to see the process. This is how we hold people in power accountable. There is no other way. Th this is it. This is the show. So it is important crucially important every moment every moment is is accessible to not only you know the people that the public the press uh, 
there is no other way. And I think one of the things we're seeing in Travis County is we had a system that just shut down for two years, left people in jail, no jury trials. I mean, it's not how our country was built and it's not what the constitution, it's not how it was supposed to function. There was never a mechanism to shut down the jury system in the United States of America. So we should not be surprised that to revive it is, is a bit harder than anticipated. And I think all of the clunky mechanics and inadvertent errors are, are all a part of a system that quite frankly is just getting back on track in Travis County. So for the sake of our discussion, let's, let's presume that a jury is fully sworn in, fully impaneled tomorrow. Um, since we are still in jury selection, I wanna just talk about what their life may look like over the next several weeks for people who have never sat, sat on a jury. Are they sequestered, for example? Do they have security? What is their own kind of risk of exposure um, going, going forward? Rick, can you, can you just speak to that? Well, it's not gonna be a lot of fun, and hopefully none of them had summer travel plans to Europe or anywhere else, uh, because unless they somehow get excused and this process starts over, everyone that gets put on that jury should expect to be tied up basically the entire month of June. I can tell you if I was either defending Daniel Perry or part of this prosecution team, I would not be happy about starting evidence potentially on a Thursday or maybe even a Friday. That is not how you like to try cases. It puts the jury in a bad position. It puts the litigants in a bad position. So sequestration is optional and you have to request it usually in advance because what they have to do is they have to go into a hotel, they have to take out phones, they have to take out media. I mean, it is a process. And when you're talking about doing it for 14 people, you know, if there's alternates, that, that's a huge thing. So personally, in a case like this, I would absolutely want a jury sequester because there's just, I mean, as we see, there's, there's a lot of media attention. So who has to ask for, how does that literally happen? Either party. To, either party. But the defense request. would be the ones usually that would want it, but I believe the state could ask too. Yeah, this is a strange trial where whether I'm the government or I'm representing Daniel Perry, I can see benefit in Chris media Taylor, attention. Yeah. Or sorry, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got Perry on the mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Taylor. You closely Taylor, followed rather. that case. Right. Yeah, as well. we'll talk about yeah. something else. Yeah. Um, so the judge will give instructions uh, to the members of the jury, uh, as well as prior instructions that were given to all the members of the panel, the prospective jurors, that say, "Don't go out and do your own research." Don't go on to Twitter, don't go search kview.com for all of their wonderful coverage of the Christopher Taylor trial. Don't do that. Uh, which in some ways is like telling an eight-year-old boy, don't kick the red ball. You're just reminding them that there's this wealth of information out there. And just like we saw in the Daniel Perry trial, on these high profile cases, there's a serious risk that jurors are gonna go out and do their own types of investigation. And that's not how the process is supposed to work. Just to add to that, I think in addition to what Rick's saying, the other huge risk for, for me when I have a high profile case is that those jurors are going to go home and their loved ones are going to go, I know this case. You better put that guy down or whatever right, it is. Right, right. That's another real risk. Even if you don't know anything else about it, you're still going home to your loved ones and family and friends who know you're in this trial. Even if you're following the rules yourself and yes. not consuming news or not discussing the case, someone yes. else may say something like that to you. Well, or ask about something that they heard about on the news. It is, it is a uh, landmine of things that could go wrong on a trial that lasts especially a prolonged period of time. Let me give an example of that, Tony. So in this case, the district attorney filed what's called a 404B notice. That's a notice of other bad acts that the government intends to introduce at some other phase of the trial. That's a public document. That's document in this case has been reported on and it contains very specific allegations that Christopher Taylor was not truthful. Now it's unlikely that any of that information is going to come into evidence during the guilt innocence phase of the trial. But if you know, juror number two goes home and is talking with their spouse and the spouse hears the story of, oh golly, did you hear that Christopher Taylor wasn't honest about such and such? That can result in a type of bias and result in a process that's not a fair trial for both sides. 
Again, I just want to come back to a point that, that we talked about earlier, and I've asked others about this as well, and just in closing, want to get your thoughts on it as well. Um, of course, we, it's unclear if opening statements may begin tomorrow afternoon, but as this case goes forward, I just want to hear both of your thoughts on the significance of this, not only for our community, both, you know, both of you have lived in Austin and worked in Austin, for many years, I want to just ask as residents, but also as practitioners in the criminal justice system, how significant and monumental is this case to our community and the justice community? I think it's, I think it could be a watershed moment. You know, I've sat on the Police Accountability Committee for the city of Austin side by side with APD officers, and there has been one of the strongest pushes in any city to push back against uh, real transparency and data collection that would be helpful in officers. I mean, we have some of the least transparent, uh, one of the least transparent contracts with police officers in the country. And I think that this is going to be a problem. I think our community, you know, has, has repeatedly made it clear that they want accountability, that we as Austinites want a safe community, but we don't want it at the expense of people of color and civil rights and fairness and everything else. And so I think a lot of people are looking at this trial. To, they want Christopher Taylor to have a fair trial, of course, but they also, I think, in the past have seen how different rules apply to police officers when they go through a trial than, say, your average citizen. And so I think in light of what has gone on nationally, we are looking at this through a different lens now, and this could be. How about you, Rick? In a murder case, no one really wins and, and no one loses, right? Because it's a tragedy all the way around. Christopher Taylor's life is uh, inalterably changed, the same with Michael Ramos's family's loss. That being said, this case has unique features. As you said, Tony, it's the first time in Travis County history that an officer is being prosecuted for murder for an act committed in the line of duty. Uh, just like the Daniel Perry trial was ultimately about the conflict between self-defense and stand your ground, this trial is basically a conflict between what are the expectations of law enforcement officers versus their right either to self-defense, to defend a third party, or potentially to use deadly force to stop someone fleeing arrest. The, the question will end up being uh, for this jury whether or not they feel that this was a justified killing. So right. Very important case with a lot of complex but, but critically uh, important issues. Thank you both for joining us tonight to, to walk through it. We appreciate it and we hope you will continue to tune in throughout this trial for our daily recaps and analysis. And if you miss any, you can always get caught up to speed on KVU.com and on KVU+. We'll be back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m.